This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. It's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to introduce our speaker, Professor Kurt Forster, but also to initiate our series UCSD by design. As many of you know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the University of California at San Diego. As part of our celebration of and reflection on this half century, the Division of Arts and Humanities at UCSD is sponsoring a range of activities to help us understand the nature of art, architecture, and urban design, all of which have uniquely characterized not only our campus, but the community as a whole in which we live. UCSD by design explores the relationship of the built environment to the natural environment. It reflects on the ways in which we live, teach, study, and work in aesthetic spaces. And we hope that it will provoke future discussion of the role of the public university in particular in the shaping of communities of culture. One of the centerpieces of UCSD by design is the lecture series we begin tonight. In partnership with the Museum of Contemporary Art, we will be sponsoring five events that will bring art historians, architects, university professionals, and community leaders together for productive discussion of our themes. We are also the co-sponsors of a remarkable new publication, some of which you may have seen, The Campus Guide to UCSD. And we welcome community members, familiar and new, to the campus to explore its rich built and natural experience. This has been an extraordinarily collaborative effort, and I crave your patience for me to thank some of the many people who have been involved in this project. All are too numerous to mention, but let me single out some principles. First, I want to call attention to Heath Fox, the Assistant Dean of the Division of Arts and Humanities, someone with a rich experience in museum management and art an architectural understanding who in many ways has been the organizational engine behind our project. Next, I'd like to acknowledge Boone Hellman, the UCSD campus architect, and in many ways the architectural conscience of our project, and to acknowledge as well, as I've been given to understand, that today marks the 25th anniversary of Boone's affiliation with UCSD, and as many of us uh, spoke up to, uh, congratulated him and said that, that he looks very good for 25. <laughs> I'd also like to thank you, Davies, uh, the director of MCA here, who could not be with us tonight, but who's been a brilliant and effective supporter of, supporter of our institutional and community mission. And I want to thank the entire staff of MCA for their generosity and their help in organizing these lectures. I'd like to thank Mary Beebe, who's the director of the famed Stewart Collection at UCSD and a great friend of the campus and the Division of Arts and Humanities. I'd like to thank Professor Teddy Cruz of the Department of Visual Arts at UCSD, whose artistic vision has done a great deal to help us hone our focus on public culture and urban life. And I'd like to thank Dr. Denise Branton, our project scholar and architectural historian who's provided much of the intellectual and academic content for our plan and our project. Our lecture tonight will be followed by a Friday morning discussion on the UCSD campus, and this will be the format for all of our events. Tomorrow's event will be in the Student Services Center at UCSD beginning at 10 a.m., and all of you are welcome to attend. Now, let me say a few things in welcome of our speaker tonight, Professor Kurt Forster. 
Kurt Forster is the Vincent Scully Visiting Professor of Architectural History at the Yale School of Architecture. He's formally taught at Stanford, MIT, the Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule in Zurich, and I say that just so you can see that I can pronounce it, the Bauhaus University in Weimar, and he's directed research at the Getty Research Institute and at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. He also curated the architectural exhibition for the 2004 Be Venice Biennial. Were I to give you all of Professor Forster's accomplishments and experiences, we'd be here all night. But let me just call attention to some highlights. Born in Zurich, Switzerland, he studied the history of art and architecture in Switzerland, Germany, the United Kingdom, Italy, and he also studied musical composition with Nadia Boulanger and Pierre Boulez before coming to the United States in 1965 to teach the history of art and architecture at Yale University. He's taught at Stanford, Berkeley, Harvard, MIT. He was the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Getty Center for the History of Art, now the Getty Research Institute, beginning in 1984. Um, he returned to teaching when he was appointed the Jacob Burkhart Chair at the ETH in Zurich. He's been director of the Canadian Center for Architecture, the Gropius Chair at Bauhaus University, and he assumed his present position at Yale uh, just a few years ago. He's published widely in the fields of contemporary 19th and 20th century art, mannerism, renaissance, classical art, and architecture. He sat on numerous advisory boards. He is a remarkable scholar, a brilliant speaker, and a truly engaged colleague and individual. We should be pleased and honored tonight that he's come to speak to us on his topic, Sea, Sky, and Science, the UCSD campus between the real and the ideal. Professor Forster. Good evening. One has to be wired for such occasions. And I'm just trying to make sure that I have uh, all the various things which uh, beep and flutter and fly and respond and uh, um, burn their way into our attention um, in the proper shape. And I think I do in order to express my thanks to all those who have made my visit at UC San Diego possible and who have virtually overwhelmed me with fresh information about the campus and its history. And this during a day described as grim. If that's what it is, I'll stay. <laughs> but my visits over the years have made lasting impressions, but the occasion of this task called for more. I thank Denise Bratton, the design project historian and the friends since my years at, at the Getty Research Institute. Of course, I thank uh, Dean Lohrer, I uh, thank um, Boone Hellman and uh, numerous others uh, who have made sure that um, uh, my uh, various uh, technical uh, salvos will actually fire. Um, it must be a rare occasion indeed when a campus can trace its mythical beginnings back a hundred years its actual inception, 50 years, and the campus architect's anniversary of 25 on the job. If I were to add my own years, we would be right back in Mexican history. If I say something, therefore, that is not accurate, not true, or too true, it is entirely my fault. I understand that we'll have occasion, as was announced tomorrow morning, to discuss some of the issues further that bear directly on the campus, its architecture, and its remarkable landscape setting. And I certainly look forward to hearing from your experiences in this regard. I should perhaps confess that many years ago, UC San Diego offered me a position in their art department. When Newton Harrison, who had taken a seminar with me at Yale a few years earlier, invited me to campus. If I had accepted the offer, I wouldn't be here tonight. On the other hand, I doubt that I would have much to say if it weren't for an early interest in a university that continues to advance in spectacular fashion. 
Even from afar, the campus of UC San Diego shines and twinkles. Yours is one of the rare universities to carry a library building in its logo and marine lore in its history. The library is named for a man we all know under his nom de plume. And I wonder, does Dr. Seuss have anything to do with the fact that a number of species of rare parrots have established themselves in San Diego suburbs after teaching a nation to pronounce things in extraordinary way and uh, to turn words into battle cries? Or does a nearby Carlsbad ring a bell? There, the architect of the Scripps Oceanic Institute, Irving Gill, spent the last months of his life. Dr. Jonas Salk was more fortunate in securing a splendid site for his institute. Beyond its arresting beauty, he set a mark with the architecture of Louis Kahn, an all-time high for institutional building in California and quite possibly in the nation. To stand on its Acropolis, or so one would like to think, and to see hang or delta gliders swoop through the U-shaped frame of the plaza is to momentarily forget that they are not winged dinosaurs suspended in the eons of unimaginable geological time. It's the sky or the sea here with only a cliff separating them, only a blink of the eye plumbing the abyss. I can think of only one other place where in the middle of the 19th century, the latest achievements of technology opened up a startling vision of the depth of time. The reassembled Crystal Palace at Sydenham presided over a recreated primeval swamp in which iguanodons, semi-fictional early dinosaurs, built out of concrete, offered visitors a taste of remote times while they were dining inside them. In fact, it is one of those startling um, imaginary uh, documents of the, of the mid 19th century that this Crystal Palace, the utmost accomplishment of modern technology, uh, with uh, its uh, slope washed by water pumped by steam engines to that slope would finally lead you down into the very depth of biological, geological time as it began to dawn on thoughtful students of the history of geology, of biology, and of um, the cosmos in general. Marine biology is, one imagines, the destiny of this ledge of land over the Pacific Ocean from which to contemplate time and change. Just like the waves that lap the rocky shore, the wooden window bays nestle inside the concrete frame of the offices for the scientists in Kahn's building. A long, narrow channel of water that seems to have the consistency of glycerin draws an orthogonal line toward the horizon. This is a rare place made for thinking. And if it'll ever be excavated in future millennia, I bet it would be recognized as such. Why did it not have a stronger effect upon the campus that was springing up simultaneously? Not that the Salk Institute was lost on others. I have taken several architects to the site and to Dr. Salk, the Italian architect Aldo Rossi among them. A quarter of a century ago, we spent an unforgettable afternoon in La Jolla inspecting the Institute and admiring its architecture as if we had scaled some ancient building in search of insight. It must be a privilege and at times an embarrassment to have such a masterpiece nearby. Yet the Salk Institute is only one of your neighbors. What is the share of San Diego's plan with its square park and its ravines in the evolution of the campus? 
Subtly or overtly, American campuses take shape by means of complex exchanges with towns. When we look at campuses, we do well to remember when and where they were established. And beyond the models that immediately come to mind, since we all tend to reinforce success by endless imitation, we also need to look for the larger picture, for the vision that may have motivated founders and planners. The frugal culture of early New England did not hesitate to enforce sharp distinctions, to separate what was distinct in nature and to attribute a precise place to everything. Life at college was not to be all toil and travail, but an experience of a lifetime and possibly of a calling. At Yale, as at Harvard and elsewhere, simple brick buildings housed the students and classrooms during the early years. Literally a fence, and you can see what prominence it is given in the picture, a literally a fence set the campus off from the New Haven Green, marking a boundary where there hardly was one. Before the growth of the university and its own policy of entrenchment imposed a more austere barrier in the form of a chateau-like front that you see today. But even medieval rampars are more picturesque than electronic gates, numerical coats, and police intercoms. You cannot visit any colleges at Yale uh, these days unless you are equipped with these um, um, uh, coded and electronic uh, uh, cards. Only the drawbridge is missing, but anyone entering realizes that she has reached a guarded gate beyond which one is quickly found a stranger. Actually, the division between town and gown went a good deal further than those fences. And as fence sitters, you can see here a class of the 1890s, and uh, I think it makes very clear uh, what uh, uh, what extraordinary significance that um, uh, border, however flimsy in its physical uh, nature, must have ha had. Uh, in the plans drawn up jointly by James Hillhouse and the painter John Trumbull. You remember Trumbull, the chronicler of the revolution who cast key events at the nation's birth into enduring images? which, by the way, were enshrined in a special museum without windows on the campus itself. Now, Hillhouse and Trumbull envisaged more than a simple barrier. They set the campus, then just a row of Spartan brick buildings that I believe you can see here, off from the New Haven Green by a fence, a double row of trees, and a, uh, a gravel path. Beyond the row, as you look up here, beyond the row of houses, uh, you enter into a world of an altogether different cast. Um, uh, nature has taken its revenge on this uh, uh, project where, where all these water stains that are here have to be discreetly overlooked. And you will immediately be able to follow, if you do that, what the plan actually uh, proposes. Beyond the row, I said, we leave the straight lines behind and enter meandering paths, go all the way around. Uh, the geometry of the town gives way to irregular islands, Trumbull even proposed a botanical garden, gathering rare species of trees and shrubs, casually evoking an idyllic enclave. Elms, acacias, uh -huh, and snowballs and laurels added color. Hedges and fragrant flowers contrasted with a rather drab picture of the town. Nothing less than a sacred grove was to surround students inside the precinct of the college. Education would refine the new generations and inculcate a taste 
for the beauties of this world, with which, of course, they seem to have a right to be surrounded. Uh, and uh, moreover, a taste for human endeavors and natural wonders that stirred students to become discoverers of such remote heights as those of Machu Picchu, the sublime cascades of the Amazon, or the barometric pitches of Wall Street. The relationship between campus and town does, of course, vary from place to place and from time to time, to the point of making comparison sometime arbitrary. But a number of colleges were established at a remove from towns and at a safe distance from their temptations. But expanding towns gradually caught up with some of these originally isolated campuses, absorbing them into distinctly urban entities. And conversely, other colleges gave rise to expanding settlements in their neighborhood, creating the typical college town. Once modern civilization caught up with insular college campuses, their autonomy called for clear demarcation, even sharp distinction between town and gown. Fences took on yet again a weighty symbolism, apart from fulfilling the very real purpose of enforcing the distinctions I mentioned. A prime example of an urban campus, Columbia University in the city of New York, is surrounded by fences no less imposing than those of the Elysee Palace of the French president, and it maintains its own ground when crossing uh, city avenues, and suddenly uh, those avenues can turn into underpasses even, as if commoners, pedestrians, were forever excluded from gaining that high ground um, on which you have to be surrounded by fences, of course, to, um, to become a permanent member. Now, their distinct scale and sometimes a certain degree of elegance distinguish urban campuses, particularly when they were conceived as such. Even the early renderings of the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis anticipated a condition not unlike that we've just seen at Columbia University, minus, uh, I might add, its role as a slumlord. Even making allowances for the ideal nature of the Minneapolis plan, the concept of a grand urban campus remains impressive, sharing perhaps more with the Viennese architect Otto Wagner's museum district than with the schematic traditions that prevailed in Chicago and elsewhere. The ideal here rests on the ambition to make a university as self-sufficient as possible, but also similar to the best that urban civilization had achieved. This was, and to some considerable extent remains, a precarious balance. For towns, as we know, have their own life, and some even fear their own death. They do not submit to tidy criteria, unless, and here's the rub, you think of them as thoroughly artificial towns, as a kind of Disneyland of the mind. The plans for Union College, in upstate New York in the early 19th century, and of course those for Stanford toward the close of the 19th century, put into a nutshell, or we might almost say put into a time capsule, what may have been valid and cherished at their creation, but may since have gathered dust. If uniqueness of character is due to a special purpose, self-sufficiency a hallmark of independence, then university campuses are rightfully exempt from so much that spells the daily fate of normal or regular towns. But precisely to the extent that campuses grapple with the problems of any other community, their separateness only increases expectations. In fact, one might say they are towns under surveillance. They are towns 
um, watched by others for their uh, capacity to perform and negotiate the, um, uh, negotiate the exchange of often competing and contrasting forces that they themselves generate. So comparing the evolution of the campus and the parallel development of towns would make for a fascinating study. Sobering, perhaps, as we discover parallels, but quite possibly also contrasts, because the experiences of one do not leave the other unaffected. In the long run, UC San Diego may reach the point at which its internal order and its adjacency to the city, um, although suburban in, in its nearby neighborhoods, create conditions that simulate or anticipate future stages in the life of American cities. Here in one of the early stages of the campus development and in a moment in a more advanced uh, condition. The future is likely to entail a lot of piecemeal rather than wholesale transformation and it may produce a marbled rather than a homogeneous result. It would appear that UC San Diego will have room to experiment in this direction and do so without simply fleshing out its master plan. The latest of these plans does suggest a striking change of mind when compared with one of its earlier iterations, and this is a subject I'd like to briefly return to later. If Yale College was inevitably Janus-faced, taking a firm stand toward and sometimes against the town in which it is located, it also, it also sought to involve itself in the economy of New Haven. And this engagement takes different forms. As an employer, as an entrepreneur, promoter and participant, partner, developing, as so many universities have done since the Second World War, industrial parks, and other symbiotic interests. UC San Diego is in the vanguard of the latest stages that thrive on spin-offs from those areas of advanced research that enjoy the greatest potential. So instead of fences, affinities can gain the upper hand. Similarity represents the other side of this two-faced condition with the world out there. On the one hand, the planners of Yale College, as you saw in that document, worried about a piecemeal layout that would, and I quote them, preclude the possibility of reconciling the whole university to any degree of elegance or uniformity, as Hillhouse and Trumbull put it to the corporation in 1792. Washington, D.C. had barely been laid out. Elegance and uniformity, as they said, are plainly urban ideals, and chiefly European ones at that. With such an ideal, utilitarian buildings, even modest outhouses, deserve consideration and a Latin designation. Here are three of those outhouses that seem to correspond with kind of micro scale to the orderly fashion in which the um, residences for students uh, uh, and uh, halls, uh, auditoriums, were uh, 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 ar arrayed on the plan. And in the case of these outhouses, th the description is as temples of cloacina. So, <laughs> That uh, dignifies anything, I suppose. Learning can do that, you know. Uh, when it is, brings its attention to whatever it is, it suddenly sounds better than it actually is. So <laughs> the college fathers were reaching for monumental standards, even in these nether regions. Obviously versed in the business they discussed, Hillhouse and Trumbull wanted to ensure that buildings, and I quote them again, would admit of being pursued gradually, and whether partially or completely executed, would be in all stages handsome, 
Now, I'm sure that's something that's been whispered into the ear of the campus architect more than once. So they, Trumbull and Hill House, always considered the campus to have a special standing. Therefore, they insisted that the very nature and form of the ground seems to point it out. And here is, as it were, a first uh, whiff of an understanding of landscape, of topography, and of a necessary uh, integration of the building with its site and of the activities in the buildings with the nature of the surroundings. They were hoping then to achieve something unique, difficult to find anywhere else, as they proudly added, in America or in Europe. They wished their public buildings to be seen to such advantage. So in other words, the campus becomes uh, a piece of uh, an exhibition. It becomes the site of a demonstration of what a culture is able to accomplish and is able to carry through under the exempt conditions of a campus. And therefore, uh, reach a level that would be rarely, if ever, uh, attained in the world out there. So Hillhouse and Trumbull cherished the college and envisaged its expansion and its progress for a long time to come. In the space of two centuries, their expectations were not only met, but gradually uh, outdone. UC San Diego squeezed a comparable development into just a half century and still contemplates major projects. This is quite an extraordinary feat, of course, in itself, and all the more though, gi uh, so given the uh, starting conditions that we had occasion to briefly allude to at the beginning. So by contrast to its initial expansion, staking out different areas and distinguishing them, the coming phase is likely to be one of what one could call reforestation, of making selectively denser and at some time more penetrable um, relationships in what continually threatens to morph into the hybrid stage either of an industrial park or a subdivision. And the center that's in the picture uh, before you is actually a uh, remarkable high point, I would uh, say, in this development in that it reaches a possibly singular um, uh, degree of density and yet is able precisely uh, for that reason uh, to convey the generosity, openness, and diversity of the space and its characteristics um, th in which we can move. This is actually a, a, a puzzling contradiction perhaps, but a very illuminating uh, one, illuminating in the sense that we can understand that very often what seem to be the conditions or the characteristics laid down in a plan do actually not come to life when the plan's executed and conversely, when something is done that seems to um, modify even profoundly the anticipated conditions may have a result far superior to what the plan might have done. We could also go back, remember Bertolt Brecht had a good one on that in the three penny operas, M make a plan and then of course make a second plan, neither's gonna work as he put it. The coming years may call for a perhaps more surgical almost laser-like approach, especially as buildings will inevitably come up for renovation, for transformation, for retrofitting, and so forth, as it were, beginning to move into the coiling motion of history, which revisits again and again its own uh, previous phases, its own, its own successes and, uh, and possibly defeats. Not all campuses, um, expected to return to what was called at the time of Hillhouse and Trumbull a peaceable kingdom. Uh, some, for instance, like Cranbrook, imported the vision of a civilized landscape, matching vistas a la Versailles, you'll see them in a moment, 
with the closely arranged colonnades of provincial Italian towns. On the eve of his departure from Finland, Eliel Saarinen, Saarinen's father, had developed an ambitious plan for a new campus of the University of Technology in Helsinki. As you can immediately pick out the classic uh, tree-lined urban avenues and the counter axes which finally terminate in some singular point of reference, whereas along its way opens up generously to lateral squares, to cross axes, which allow an ultimately coherent but always very carefully calibrated uh, hierarchy of further development, putting at the university's disposal large areas of the landscape for future development. He laid uh, out in uh, analogy to recent urban scheme, schemes as his own, uh, the plan for the campus at uh, Cranbrook, and it uh, doesn't take a particularly sharp eye to recognize immediately how an alternation of open spaces with often, with often uh, asymmetrical entry of major connecting corridors leads to optically quasi-foreshortened uh, uh, depth, as we can see it uh, in both instances here, but with one uh, significant departure in that, in a curious way, this plan in Cambridge, in, in Cranbrook, uh, looks and feels more European even than the one that is uh, uh, more uh, adamant in its uh, hierarchies and in its abstraction in Helsinki itself. Now, um, the, uh, Saarinen's ability uh, was to prove crucial for his role as an architect and, of course, as an educator in the United States. And while teaching at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, where Albert Kahn, the engineer of grand automotive plants, was also designing buildings, Sarinen came into contact with George Booth, the Detroit uh, press man in 1924. And Booth and his wife, Ellen Scripps Booth, were eager to establish a private school for girls and an art academy. And they set aside huge tracts of land in what was to become Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. An enterprise so fascinating even to international peripatetic architects like Le Corbusier, who is here seen visiting on site at Cranbrook um, uh, Saarinen and inspecting this creation of a kind of miniature ville radieuse of a somewhat different cut than uh, Corbusier, of course, would have given it. The booths followed in the footsteps of such founders as Governor Stanford of California, uh, whose newly established university on the peninsula, as you might recall, was nicknamed the farm. And more remarkable still uh, than Sarinen's imaginative site plan at Cranbrook is his wish to avoid any tears in the fabric of the school, uh, allowing no slump in attention, no neglect of details, or no lack of grand vistas and depth. And it's remarkable that here, too, seemingly contradictory things come together. A memory of the grand sort of Baroque aristocratic vistas of the cascading bodies of water, of uh, imaginative combination of sculptural um, and floral elements with the varying geometry of the site, and at the same time, um, the fine grain, which particularly in the buildings, uh, produced uh, surprising um, uh, results. The cadence of the campus unfolds along this series of parkours that thread through each quadrant and each one in a different fashion. And as you ascend a few steps off the sidewalk and approach the doorway, you catch a glimpse through the leaded glass, the hand-woven linen made in the studios, curtains, and um, so forth through the snow-covered garden beyond. It would probably take a Vladimir Nabokov to render the intricacies and the multi-sensory nature of 
such experiences, which are very much alive to this day, and as you may know, Cranbrook continues in a very vital manner uh, to draw other interesting architects from uh, Rafael Monet from Spain, uh, um, or Hall from uh, New York, uh, and others into the ambit of its expanding campus. In a letter to Aldo Rossi, you've seen him briefly with me, beginning at the Salk Institute, the German architect Oswald Matthias Ungers put his finger on it when he wrote in January 1979 uh, to Rossi, I was at Cranbrook and made a rare and powerful experience there, thanks to the architecture. I experienced the feeling of hope, of a realized utopia, independent of politics, timeless, real, but still a dream. True, Cranbrook is a special case, an art academy and a site of aesthetic education, as perhaps only a Scandinavian vision of the modern and an American resolve to put it into practice could have achieved. In this regard, Cranbrook approximates an American version of the Bauhaus, with which it is virtually simultaneously uh, based, as they both were, on the tension between exceptionally talented individuals and a collective ideal of artistic work. In both instances, architecture, indeed the very landscape of the campus, here fresh with not even all uh, residue and machinery removed from the site in Dessau for the Bauhaus, proved integral to this educational purpose. In other words, architecture is not just the stage set, the ornament, the prerequisite, but it is in fact an instrument of education. If the second Bauhaus at Dessau centered on a now famous building, a pinwheel that torques administration, workshops, studios, student residences into a highly articulated whole, Cranbrook, by comparison, was distinctly more relaxed and expansive in its alternation between courtyard and vista, cluster and spread. What does link them both with the broader tendencies that have continued to shape such campuses is the scattered structure of large exhibitions that were so popular at the time, particularly influential was the Stockholm World's Fair of 1930, designed by the Swedish architect Gunnar Asplund. To all intents and purposes, Asplund laid out the fairgrounds as a kind of campus on which natural features, water, trees, microclimate, etc., were conjoined with wide promenades and rambling paths allowing you both to gain a sense of direction and abandoning yourself to the spontaneous uh, interest that might come as you wander through the territory, discovering something about the land that you would not have otherwise seen. And of course, multiple means of transportation accentuated by display structures and replete with public amenities, remember those three temples of Cloacina in, at Yale, and here, of course, so to remember what Freud said what made, when he came to get his honorary doctorate at Clark University and traveled with uh, uh, Jung and Fenchi to the United States in 1908, and coming back, he drew the, the conclusion that um, he could really live in the United States only with great difficulties, and when asked why, it was that he couldn't find any wild strawberries and there weren't public toilets in the city. Uh, a descendant of the Stockholm exhibition opened its doors in 1933 uh, on Lake Michigan, where the Century of Progress exhibition embedded an astounding array of buildings, uh, here uh, even uh, aerial tramways, uh, so-called rocket cars, uh, uh, dramatizing that uh, choice of various forms of transportation. But in its layout around the artificial lagoon was not only echoing 
uh, directly Asplund's Stockholm exhibition, but was giving clear evidence of its intent to create a kind of model settlement with all the variety from ideal one-family houses to great industrial display pavilions. Um, the conjunction between nature, uh, highly stylized, of course, and greatly enriched, and an urban array of buildings, advanced in technology and purposeful in their appointments, has been a hallmark of campus planning ever since. Consequently, campuses offer an experience that transcends the humdrum nature of daily routine. When natural features are crowded out and mechanical contrivances cancel any sense of the larger context, the ideal underlying the very notion of campus avoids the blanket application of asphalt and concrete as it transforms the topography and the flora of a site. A campo can be many different things, from military exercise grounds to cow pastures. And the campo vaccino, here in a, in a uh, uh, restyled uh, Netherlandish uh, version, in the center of Rome, that mythical field of ancient ruins and sundry remains has, of course, fascinated visitors to Rome for many centuries and left uh, a deep imprint on the imagination uh, of uh, the relationship of the past, even in its ruined remains, and of the present experience we gain of the land and of the city. So where cattle grazed among the ruins of temples and churches, some visitors may have felt corralled within its confines rather than elated by the discovery of hollowed ruins. Similarly, a college campus tends to fall halfway between the two, between the place it was granted and the structures that it had to build, between a past that keeps accumulating at a fast clip, measured as it is by the succession of class of students after class of students, scientific discovery after discovery, and their subsequent commercial exploitation. And the future may not always beckon from beyond the fence, but often lie within the campus itself. And in this regard, the story of UC San Diego com campus holds particular interest because it reaches back to the early years of the 20th century when the Scripps Oceanographic Institute was established in La Jolla. In the post-war period, when military camps and undeveloped city land were combined into extensive university grounds, the city of San Diego assumed the role of an urban protagonist uh, for a campus otherwise largely nestled in natural scrub. The classic polarity between private initiative and public purpose, between isolated beginnings and highly complex conditions that result from those beginnings, played out once more at dizzying speed. What makes the history of UC San Diego special stems in part from its geographic location, in part from its active role, exceptional success in research and industrial expansion. Instead of living within a tight casement of long for long periods of time, UC San Diego has frequently molded, to use a marine analogy, and therefore offers planners the succulent taste of a soft-shell crab rather than the hard carapace of an ossified creature. At every turn in its history, the campus seems to have taken cues from the culture at large as well as from the discrete nature <clears throat> of its privileged circumstances. As a shorthand of what I have in mind, let me remind you of the fact that the architecture of the original Scripps Institute employed highly experimental technology. The young architect Irving Gill erected a structure of spare and economical nature right at the ocean's edge. Entire facades were poured on the ground and tilted into place. 
The building's striking exterior was matched by an interior. I apologize, I couldn't in the end um, find the image, it, but I know it exists, uh, of the uh, apartment of the first director, Ritter, within the building. And so in 1910, uh, the building freely shed the frills of its time. And when you cast a glimpse at a comparable institution, Anton Dorn's Marine Biology Institute that opened in Naples, also before even the, shore, the embankments there were constructed in 1873, you may be surprised by the air of a sort of grand hotel or casino uh, that came with it. But consider its library with its magnificent wall paintings by the German painter Hans von Mares, whose images possess the same elemental quality and beauty Gill wished to confer onto his scripts building, convinced as he was that houses ought to be simple, I quote him, simple, plain, and substantial as a boulder. What springs from the mind will assume, once it's realized, the traits that belong to things, and such things could be splendid in their simplicity. Not by chance that thing is inanimate rather than alive, inorganic and therefore thoroughly engineered. And Gill argued that we should, and I quote him once more, leave the ornamentation to nature, who will tone the building with lichens, chisel it with storms, make it gracious and friendly with vines and flower shadows as she does the stone in the meadow. This is an almost biblical can commitment to welcoming the inevitable partial um, uh, decline of the physical well-being, if you want, of uh, the thing of the building and an extraordinarily generous uh, division of labor, if you want, between the architect and the processes of nature herself. Now, by contrast, the vaunted campus library designed by the firm of Alexander Pereira, aims at something altogether more questionable, namely at landmark status before there is anything to commemorate. I hope you won't think it too irreverent when I suggest that the cantilevered library floors reassure the traveler in the way a water tank of yore inspired confidence in the train conductor at the Nevada train station. They've got it, they, they have it, it seems to scream, right? And oddly related to other 60s notions of treasures and technology. Actually, isn't it surprising that at that moment, virtually on the verge to what will become the media revolution which will change every book, even in the way we handle it or approach it or think of it and what we make of it, uh, that at that moment one should have uh, curiously wished to enshrine the book as if it were a rare jewel, something like a diamond in a uh, splendid uh, setting. And we have more examples of that as in the Rhein uh, Beinecke Rare Book Library, simultaneously constructed uh, by Gordon Bunshaft of Skidmore and Merrill, where early printed books and other rarities are enshrined like bullion might have been at Fort Knox. Uh, when we still had gold standard, of course. Now, the uh, Geisel Library springs from a rather limited feat of the imagination uh, as a housing for what is certainly one of the ever-expanding assets of any university ought never to preclude expansion. Therefore, to build a library that is in and of itself, even in its technical concept, a finished and finite object is in and in, in of itself are contradictory um, by, con by um, comparison to its purpose and, and its content. But as a showpiece, uh, uh, it uh, does rather better, but then again, I apologize, I can't show it to you. It lacks both the engineering elegance of the nearly contemporary Olympic Stadium by Nervi in Rome, which you might recall in the dome with those Y-shaped, uh, radially arranged, uh, 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 buttresses that uh, receive the dome above 
and where indeed the exhibition of the tectonic nature of the forces and of the dynamics at play as you displace weights, cantilever them, stack them up, and so forth, is given an extraordinarily resolved um, articulation. Or uh, it doesn't quite um, uh, successfully compete with the more recent uh, urbane scale and taut nature of Rem Kolhas's Seattle Public Library that is also trying in some ways to uh, make a comparable gesture. As a problem child of its age, Geisel may have ingratiated itself, but not for genuinely architectural qualities. A lesson may perhaps spring from an unexpected aspect, temporary rather than monumental in nature, uh, offering both flexibility and utility, and with a lower threshold of inhibition, permitting short-lived change. And as I suggested before, I think we are entering a, we're already in a period which is characterized by far shorter, more uh, accentuated and rapid cycles and changes, and therefore many long-term goals will be reached only by short-term decisions and solutions. So the camouflaged Quonset huts on campus here have served for varying periods in many other places. They are beautifully painted and they become or virtually the equivalent of abstract sculptures. At an early stage in the planning of the Stockholm exhibition of 1930 uh, by Asplund, and for returning GIs at Yale after the war, look at this, a, a military education camp right uh, in your backyard, um, uh, we encounter these otherwise uh, rather um, um, uh, unglamorous um, uh, structures. No fear of the cheap and dirty has inspired clever answers to pressing issues, as when LA architects Hodgetts and Fung built that tower library of UCLA, which in many ways could be said to be as emblematic of UCLA in, uh, in many respects and in its best qualities, despite the fact that it had a shelf life so short that if you didn't go see it once it was built, you would miss it. Um, but it's one of those memorable episodes many wish would never have ended. And of course, we know that usually temporary solutions uh, do have the promise of staying with us that often is not inferior to the monumental ambitions of things which will very definitely stay with us, but we may not want them all the time. A number of works of art have greatly added to the UC San Diego campus. And this is really something absolutely exceptional and of the greatest value, I am convinced, not only for the educational purposes, but uh, as much for the life of the entire community well beyond the campus. And they triggered, of course, a host of reactions among the community, and they should, because if art is not even able to solicit any lively reactions, uh, one might uh, be rather concerned about its vi own vitality and future. They have etched themselves into the minds of visitors and students. They even have, in some cases, stolen the show, especially when the architectural components left something to be desired. At times, it may be a case of the rose holding up the stick rather than the other way around, but it would be more accurate to say that the superfluous changes the inalterable. Remember that. That might uh, hold uh, some sense in other situations too. Now, if the fence assumed emblematic significance for the tense relationship that sprang up between campuses and towns, Robert Irvin's running violet V-forms of 1983 cast their gossamer bands into the depth of eucalyptus stands, lastingly altering one's impression of their relationship to the ever-changing grove. As a subtle and sly intervention that changes almost nothing 
while deeply affecting our experience, Irwin's work compares to that screen we need to set between nature and the observer in order to extract what a naive perception could never touch or reach. Uh, Bob Irwin is here tonight, this uh, wonderful work. At the opposite end of the scale, Tim Hawkinson's teddy bear inflates the familiar size of a cuddly and well-worn toy to a size that holds its own in the face of what might in some respects look like exaggerated buildings, pitting their contradictions against them. The traces of material wear date from the Ice Age. Its limbs are held together by high carbon steel pins. Its transport required lorries for the space shuttle. Hence, Teddy is no less of the moment than the activities in the buildings that surround his lair. And he wins hands down, I think, over that uh, puppy by Jeff Koons. And it doesn't need watering. <laughs> I recall the proverbial fence when I mentioned Irwin's two V forms. But one may also look out for its counterpart on UC San Diego's grounds, looking for a meandering path. What could be more telling as a path than Alexis Smith's snake path of 1992? Its slithering shape appropriately uh, uh, leads to the library and wends its way through different zones of vegetation, ground covers, and uh, grades of the slope. Perhaps the Edenic implications of any campus preserve, such as Hillhausen Trumbull plotted at Yale at the end of the 18th century, resurfaced in Smith's wonderful work that retains enough of a sting to provoke contradictory reactions while recalling the Academy's deepest doubts about whose truth it is seeking. Words always raise questions. Emotions can topple them. Bruce Nauman's virtues and vices flip-flop and leave us guessing. Which of the vices will assume the guise of a virtue? What emotion may reveal a contradictory motion? It seems only fair that a community so deeply indebted to words, so vitally tied to definitions, should have them zigzag over their heads inexplicably wavering in the night. The snake path also touches on another idea. How do you thread together the ever centrifugal parts of an expanding campus? To this end, uh, Hel Helen and Newton Harrison elaborated a remarkable proposal when they submitted their campus meander in December 1997, more than 200 years after the Hillhouse and Trumbull uh, proposal. Much more than a vindication of my suggestion that the meandering path is a key to the very origin of the campus, the Harrison proposal addressed one of those nagging issues that will never go away, but will always be postponed. Taking a cue from an original landscape feature, the canyon, the Harrisons aimed to restore it to a community that had grown inured to it. The plan would have recovered something that tends to fall by the wayside without a plan. Consider that as a nomadic species, we always seek paths across the land. Our trails must be counted among the landmarks we leave, if you accept that as a shorthand, of uh, landmarks of our life. And we should allow it to prevail over parking lots, asphalt strips, highways, and property lines. In effect, I believe that such a meander insinuates a topography of connections that tends to be frustrated or terminated at many points in the daily experience of the community, precisely because it stores up a foreknowledge 
of invisible segments, as well as a memory or afterthought of others. But I must say overall that this campus uh, stands out also in this regard among some of its best competitors, that indeed it is a topography so mined by ideas, thoughts, and approaches to the place and to the activities within it that it exists as a multi-layered topography that is different in every person's mind and yet always restored to the site itself. So more than any single building or isolated work of sculpture, the meander etches the land and it casts a web of connections over the campus. It belongs to an unstable, to a shifting topography rather than an imposed order whose authority always derives from someone else, from something else. I hope that the idea, if not necessarily, of course, its exact design, may yet see the light of day. And in part, in fact, it has, perhaps almost as if the campus had a capacity uh, fostered by the, its planners and guardians to generate like a pattern on a skin, some um, element that seemed spontaneously to emerge uh, from it. Perhaps the meander will play a role like the High Line in Lower Manhattan, where grid and hierarchy prevail over the natural features of the island. On the UC San Diego campus and beyond, a new sense of the landscape might bring its remarkable site back to life and invite adventurous exploration. Experiments that the Federal Institute of Technology, the ETH, so uh, uh, perfectly uh, named and pronounced by our dean, uh, is conducting with Abu Dhabi, promises perhaps a departure from the standard approaches to planning that uh, have prevailed in that region in particular. And it's very interesting to see that for this new city of Masdar, uh, another than the uh, predictable future has been imagined with extraordinarily dense perimeter and central cores, and then in imitation of the wadi, of the uh, temporary uh, rivulets and runs of water, uh, green zones penetrate, meander through the plan and uh, offer both uh, visible connection and transportation links beyond the campus, uh, beyond the city, and at the same time provide uh, that cushion and filter which is so essential for uh, the enjoyment of spaces otherwise predetermined and um, looming in their massive dimensions. So this contrast, which they were just now in this project negotiating, has all by itself the power to generate a vital variety of passageways and create discreetly local conditions. And I have the feeling after the day of today and my direct uh, uh, impressions on campus uh, that you may very well be set on the, in the long run uh, uh, on such a course. I'm sure you don't need visitors to tell you that your campus is worth every effort and that it will continue to tell the story of your engagement with nature and with the mind, but also explore ways in which our settlements need to evolve as we renegotiate our lease with our global host. Thank you.